This week on the Backtable Podcast. If you get the opportunity of someone pulling your wire after you spent half an hour trying to cross a CTO, et cetera, of course, it's frustrating and all of us kind of cringe to that, but that's an opportunity where your senses are going to come in and your ability to go back through those planes and be able to navigate through will make you a better operator. You know, sometimes things happen for a reason. So I take it positively. Okay, let's get back and we're going to get back in. And this is where we're going to use all our senses to get through. And someone who gets through a dissection plane uh, that has been, let's say, atherectomized or ballooned to get back into the true lumen, this is where you're going to use those uh, skills to the most. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. When you need to restore flow in an ischemic limb, there's no time to lose. You need the Pounce thrombectomy system. The Pounce system from Sermonix is a purpose-built percutaneous device for removing thrombus and embolus in the peripheral vasculature. No capital equipment or aspiration needed. Just grab, go, and restore flow. It's simple. With the pound system, you place the basket wire distal to the clot, place the collection funnel proximal to the clot, pull back to collect the clot in the funnel, and retract the system through your guide sheath. The secret sauce? The pounce funnel is designed to macerate and dehydrate the clot, allowing you to remove even large amounts of material through a 7 French sheath. Visit pouncesystem.com to learn how physicians have used the device to accelerate on-table flow restoration while reducing use of thrombolytics. Pounce thrombectomy. Strike quickly to capture and remove clot. Backtable listeners, we invite you to visit the lab at Reflow during ISET, that's I-S-E-T, for a hands-on demonstration of our new and upcoming devices. It's a great opportunity to try out the Wingman Crossing Catheter with its unique extended bevel tip. The Specs LP, the low-profile version of the Specs shapeable support catheter, and the new line of core catheters for use in challenging PCI procedures. It's the pulse of medical ingenuity at work. See it for yourself at ICIT or visit us online at reflowmedical.com. And now back to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Behetti, coming to you from dreary Tacoma, Washington today. And my guest today is Dr. Hadi Lisha. Interventional Cardiovascular Specialist at Ascension St. Thomas Heart in Nashville and Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Our topic today is dissecting wire senses. How do we do it? Hadi, welcome to the show. Thank you. Big honor to be here. Before we get started, could you tell me a little bit about your practice setting? Sure. I'm an interventional cardiovascular specialist. Uh, I do both coronary and vascular interventions, both arterial and venous. And uh, basically, it's almost 50-50, and I've been in practice for about 10 years now. I'm a big fan of interventional radiologists and big fan (laughs) of your podcast. I love the creativity that you guys bring all the time and the thinking outside the box. I I love that and uh, have tons of IR friends and looking forward for a great conversation. Awesome. Do you work in an exclusively hospital environment? hospital environment. I have uh, my IR IR colleagues here are awesome. We collaborate on so many levels um, on both the pulmonary embolism side, the arterial, the venous side. So, and we have a common conference that we pick our brains every week, every, actually every other week. So it's been a tremendous experience. That sounds, that sounds like a really good setup. Okay. Well, um, you kind of reached out to us about this, this topic. So I'd love if you could kind of give an introduction. What is it? What are the components of wire senses? What does that mean? Right. First of all, you know, I'm a big fan of podcasts because it offers education outside the realm of conferences, books, and uh, kind of basically translates practical tips and tricks of um, how we can kind of work on our most complex interventions. And wire senses, I called it wire senses because. You would know who is a good interventional uh, specialist by seeing them navigate a wire and how they feel that. And that's how one of those things that you can never teach unless you're literally standing next to someone and asking asking them to go right, left, uh, loop, etc. 
So why are some, I feel like if an interventionalist is really good at going through dissections or going through tough anatomy and being able to dissect this and explain exactly what's going on and teach it to others, that would be a huge asset in our specialty and one of the core abilities that we need to acquire over time. And uh, dissecting those senses, meaning what are you feeling, what are you seeing, and how are you reacting to this? And hopefully we can discuss that today. Yeah, perfect. Um, it's. I think you're right. It's a really difficult topic to nail down because a lot of it is experience-based, right? And right. this will just be our attempt to try and break it down into, I think we have four different categories, four or five different categories of how we are going to dissect wire senses. So let's jump right in. Um, tell me about the first one, which I think we decided is visual. Absolutely. So first one is visual. This obviously makes sense. You're looking at a screen and you're kind of reacting to how the wire is behaving. So I would think three subcategories into that a visual uh, sense is number one, a two-dimensional, number two, three-dimensional, and number three, relative course of the wire to the vessel architecture, which is a combination of two-dimensional and three-dimensional, but a whole category on its own because you're considering the wire, uh, the vessel architecture uh, in itself. So the first uh, aspect is two-dimensional. So obviously, we're looking at the wire going forward and back. That's the first kind of axis going right, left. But there is also a reaction to the tip buckling versus the body of the wire buckling and finally a loop uh, small loop versus large loop so let's go through obviously forward backward uh, the operator is kind of seeing how much movement is happening with the amount of push that they're uh, giving the wire how much resistance they're feeling right and left also obviously relative to the anatomy and uh, most of the time people work under a roadmap DSA. So that's also another way to react to what's going on. Now, the tip buckling is one of the most important things that we learn when we're training. Basically, when the tip is buckling, it's completely different than when the body of the wire is buckling or if both are actually buckling. So Definitely. obviously, tip buckling through a calcified lesion allows us to know that this is a tough cap. This is something that will require more power. But of course, depending on the location of the wire, not every time the wire buckles, the tip of the wire buckles, we would have to push harder. But it's a kind of signal that the tissue that we are facing is a relatively hard tissue. Now, the body of the wire buckling is a a kind of an extension of that. If someone is in a dead end in a subintimal space and uh, the wire tip is not behaving at all despite rotation uh, advancement, uh, the body of the wire starts buckling, meaning that you're basically in the wrong channel. So right. it's kind of also right. another signal. Uh, and finally, the looping, which uh, most of us do on daily basis to cross subintimal. Uh, the size of the loop, the location of the loop, how large, how small, is a very kind of a fine art and kind of dissecting that. So let's talk about talk about uh, big loops versus small loops for for um, younger operators. Sure. So uh, obviously one of the main ways. So uh, it depends on where we're at. If we think that we are in the subintimal space, and uh, you know the whole purpose is to create a small loop first to minimize the intramural hematoma and the amount of basically the expansion of the, the larger the loop, the more you expand that dissection of the subintimal space and you, the more you allow inflow into that space to expand it to a point where you can almost not re-enter into the true lumen. So we go to a large loop whenever we are obviously failing to, go, to dissect with the small loop. The other reason why we sometimes go with a large loop is we don't know exactly where we're at, where we're at if we are in a branch versus the main vessel. And pushing the wire to see how it actually folds on itself allows us to know if we are in a side branch uh, subintimal versus in the main branch subintimal. But um, 
you know, obviously these are very dynamic um, movements that are happening as we go. Um, and uh, the initial loop would have to be relatively small with the tip of the microcatheter relatively close with, uh, you know, basically it's like surgery. You're dissecting those planes in a minute fashion versus in a big kind of dissection plane. That's a really good point. I mean, keeping your microcatheter close to the edge of, to the tip of your wire, just um, to prevent the wire from doing its own thing without support. Right. So does that, does that kind of cover everything um, in the 2D realm? Yes. I, in, in my mind, just uh, simplistically, I think uh, that would be something. If we move to the 3D, basically this is where uh, the rotation starts coming in. So you're obviously rotating the wire in 90 degrees or 180 degrees back and forth, uh, right and left. And you can imagine there are limitless possibilities for the wire to go through. So then that's what makes it an art uh, of uh, crossing a lesion rather than a science and it's a combination of both. But kind of uh, the operator is going to pick the right angle at which the, the wire seems to be going in a free fashion and then proceeding with pushing. So it's a combination of rotation and pushing. And of course, this is where we are looking at the visual feedback of this rotation. So if we feel like the wire tip is free, uh, there are two possibilities. Either we are in the true lumen or we're outside the vessel completely, or we are in a massive subintimal space where the wire is floating without even any restrictions. But we would know that by, based on the size of the loop that we had made. If we had made a large loop, then the uh, reaction to the rotation is less reliable than if we had made a small loop and we're kind of testing where the wire tip is. And that's one of the main kind of techniques for operators to know where they're at, just with the reaction of the wire tip to the rotation. Now, the second aspect of the 3D wire movements is the range of motion of the entire wire. So when we are moving a wire, we're not only looking at the tip, but we're looking at the entire uh, body of the wire, how it's behaving. If the movements sure. are archaic, uh, disorganized, going all kinds of directions without any limitation, then of course we would know we're outside a vessel structure. If there are restrictions, if the range of motion is narrow and organized, then this tells us something about where we're at also. So that, I think, is an important aspect of wire senses. Got it. Got it. So that's that kind of uh, covers the 2D and the 3D. And then tell me a little bit about what our third category was for visual. It's a, a combination of 2D and 3D, basically the course of the wire relative to vessel architecture, which has elements of both categories. But I thought this is super important. And most of us are obviously in a CTO body. We are 10 centimeters into that CTO. We're trying to find our way back to the actual vessel. And there are a lot of clues of how the wire is behaving. And if the wire shape it takes the shape of the actual vessel where we think the vessel is, especially if you have roadmap DSA, then that tells you a lot. If the wire is outside that mental structure that we have, about the main branch, it could be either in the side branch or it could be outside the vessel. Now, and in the side branch, the wire behavior would tell us also if uh, this is subintimal in the side branch versus through luminal in the side branch. If the wire is roaming free back and forth, and we see that it's kind of taking the course of a collateral or a side branch. It's different than when the wire is kind of looping in a side branch and kind of getting stuck there. And that obviously tells us, you know, this is not the way you don't want to go. And obviously, finally, when the wire is kind of behaving in an archaic fashion, disorganized, it's getting out, it's going into extra anatomical courses, that obviously tells us that, you know, we're outside the vessel. And obviously, if we have a patient under conscious sedation, you know, pain is something that we have to track. If we're starting to have patient symptoms, that's obviously a red flag. In the cardiology world, we have uh, EKG and blood pressure and, um, you know, the PVCs, the 
uh, hypotension, tachycardia, etc., would obviously let us know that we're not in the right place. Sure. But um, most of the time, a wire getting outside a vessel architecture is not a problem, even in the cardiology world. Obviously, there are exceptions, but it's the following this wire with a microcatheter or a Got balloon it. or yeah. dilating that gets people in trouble. Yeah, I think we'll get to that in the do's and don'ts part. That's very, right. very important. Anything else in the visual component that you want to talk no, about? I think that, uh, that are the things that I look for. Of course, there are nuances to everything, and there's always a dynamic reaction to the feedback of the wire. And that, as you said, this is kind of experience, but tried my best to kind of dissect that in a way that makes it as scientific as possible. <laughs> okay. I think our next category is the uh, tactile feel of the wire. So let's right. get into that a little further. So the tactile feel is obviously, I can probably subdivide it into two major categories, uh, the resistance to the wire advancement or the wire rotation. And the second one is torque transmission. You're torquing and you're seeing how the wires are re reacting to that. So the first one is resistance. So obviously we're advancing the wire and if we're feeling there's a lot of resistance, it depends on the the wire that we have so if you have a polymer jacketed wire uh, with hydrophilic coating and we have resistance then we're really in a in a place either we are in a cto in a heart tissue or we are in a subintimal space where we have to probably change directions but uh, the opposite of that is we're advancing the wire and the wire is just flying it could be flying in the true lumen which is a very good sign and depending on uh, the behavior of the rest of the wire, we can find out also if, if the vessel is outside the vascular structure. So resistance to advancement of the wire depends on the properties of the wire and uh, depends on how much feedback you're getting. And it's that third category of not too resistant, but not too free, but just right. And that just right it comes with experience and, of course, with um, doing multiple interventions and kind of feeling what the wire should feel like. There should be a small amount of resistance, but not enough to cause buckling and difficulty with advancement. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to make is sometimes you feel like it's your wires rolling free and it's because you're outside of the loop <laughs> right. and you think you think you're great until you get out. Yeah. Right. So when you're when your wire is moving really freely and you think you're true lumen, but you're actually outside outside of the lumen, um, and I think you've described something uh, important, which is kind of a Goldilocks principle, right? The wire has to move with a little bit of resistance, but not too much resistance. Right. You know, obviously, this also brings up the physical characteristics of each wire, and all of us have you know, preferences depending on our training, our experience. There are basically, I don't want to be too technical with regards to wires with, you know, mostly practical, but there are kind of six characteristics of wires that we kind of balance in the choice of our wires. The core uh, type, is it stainless steel versus nitinol? The core diameter, 014, 018, 035. The core taper, uh, how the core itself is designed uh, in terms of diameter relative to the tip. Then you have the tip design and tip penetration power. And then you have the grinds, which are the coils that surround the tip of the wire. And then finally, the coating, which would be either a polymer jacketed coating uh, in, in plus or minus hydrophilic coating versus hydrophobic co coating. So all of these are like engineering terms that don't mean anything unless you apply them in the real world. And um, most of us pick workhorse wires that have a nice balance between those characteristics and especially the tactile feedback, which, uh, you know, you can't pick a wire that's too polymer jacketed, that doesn't have any friction, too libricious, where you can't feel those movements that you're making and the resistance that we're talking about but also not something that is completely without any hydrophilic coating to a point where you can't advance into the, most of the anatomies that we see it every day. So that uh, balance between these six characteristics 
uh, allows us to kind of pick a workhorse wire. And then obviously there are some specialty wires that we can talk about a little bit later on, but uh, I feel like the resistance aspect is important uh, depending on the wire that you're using. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I'd love to kind of get into your choices of your algorithm of what you start with and then how you sure. escalate. Is it, This might be a good time for that. Yeah, that would be great. So obviously workhorse wires are very personal and, uh, you know, but there are some uh, categories that most people pick. And uh, obviously just a conflict of interest. I'm a, a consultant to Abbott, Philips, Abiumed, and Cordis. But um, most of my wire choices are from Asahi, actually, through trial and error. And I'm sure a lot of people are also fans of that. So um, my workhorse wire is uh, an Abbott wire, which is a command wire. I, I like it because of the combination of adequate support, lubricity, and tip retention. When you're banging across a CTO, you can work with it for 15, 20 minutes trying to cross uh, and you still have the retention of the, of the tip itself because of the combination of nitinol and stainless steel that they kind of hit right there. But some other people, like other wires, there are hundreds of them. But um, I, I think that's kind of my workhorse wire that I use almost 90% of the time. My other workhorse wire, if I don't have a command on the shelf, is a Gladius uh, from Asahi. Mm -hmm. A Gladius wire, the regular Gladius 014 or 018, and same thing with Command 014 and 018. Now, specialty wires, in my mind, I, I kind of divide them up into three main categories. The first ones are CTO wires that uh, have very heavy tips that allow you to kind of cross calcified caps. And this is where the Confianza Pro 12, Hornet 14, the um, Halbert wire from Asahi, are important uh, Astato wires, uh, Astato 20, Astato 30, depending on 014, 018. This is when you're really picking something to cross and then to swap to a workhorse. We're not going to keep that wire in. Second big category is the taper tip wires that allow you to find a micro channel in the CTO. And this is where the Fielder XTA, uh, Fielder XTR, the Judo wire, there are a lot of companies that make different types of wires, but I think the XTA is pretty popular. And those are not heavily tipped wires, but they taper down to 009 and they are so polymer jacketed that they find a micro channel and allow you to get in. And uh, the third big category is the supportive wire. The, the ones that, okay, now you crossed, but you really need to get equipment down. This is where the Grand Slam, Spartacore, a category Iron Man come in. And of course, uh, there are other wires that are very niche uh, derived, but kind of miscellaneous, uh, probably. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for giving us that rundown. I think that's really helpful. I think, I think you touched on a good point. It's not that one company makes every single wire that you can use to cross right. the CTOs. You have, to, you have to try a lot of different ones. You have to see what works for you. What works for you might not work for me. Exactly. Would you care to talk at all about microcatheters that you like to use? Absolutely. So microcatheters, I'm um, a big fan of the Terumo Navicross microcatheters. I think the braiding has uh, become so good that it not only allows you to advance through very tough tissue, but uh, the torque transmission of, especially with the angled microcatheter, is phenomenal. And uh, that combination has, been, has worked very well for me. Now, when I'm going transcollateral into the pedal loop, and we're talking about 014 microcatheters, uh, I really like the cardiology microcatheters, like the Turnpike LP. They go through transeptals in the heart, and they go through, or Corsair, Corsair Pro. Other Turnpike LP or Corsair Pro have worked really well, especially if you have to spin the microcatheters. Those are braided in a way that allow you to spin whenever you get stuck. There are other microcatheters you cannot spin because you can lose the tip with that, like uh, the uh, Caravelle microcatheter or Fine Cross. These are just low profile microcatheters that you just have to push through. And if you don't get through, you may want to switch to something else that's braided. But uh, those are the major carriers. And of course, in O35, it's not really a big difference, but also the Navicross has 
done a good job there, but all the companies make nice, uh, low profile, uh, hydrophilic microcatheters. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think we can kind of, uh, move over to the next category we have. We've talked, anything else you want to talk about for the tactile feel of the wire? Uh, so with the tactile feedback, I think the torque transmission is, uh, very important. Uh, and this is where some of the new wires that have additional technology, like the ACT-1 technology, uh, that allow, it's basically a rope coil that's a surrounding a rounded core that allow the transmission of the rotation from the distal aspect to the proximal aspect in a much more controlled fashion. Uh, they call it one-to-one, but of course, um, you know, and these are the Asahi type of wires, but of course there are other wires from other companies, Boston, Abbott, that uh, make very nice wires with excellent torque transmission, like the command series. And that's also important because, and it's important in your workhorse wire choice. And obviously the more torque response you have, the better it is, but it's, it gets to a point where the torque response starts working against you. Uh, meaning when you have too much friction, uh, let's say you pick a wire that has excellent torque response, but doesn't get through super calcified, uh, tortuous, um, very you know, complex uh, atheromatous lesions. So this is where kind of you hit that balance between torque transmission and lubricity. I see. Yeah. And do you feel like that's most important in your workhorse wire to have good yeah. torque transmission? Uh, absolutely. It's a, kind of like a 50-50. I wanted to kind of fly through complex anatomy, but at the same time, I don't want to lose that feel. So this is where operators kind of pick the wire that works best for them and with regards to, okay, I'm feeling that, uh, that I'm here, but, but I'm not able to cross, and then I would have to switch to another wire. So to kind of find a wire that does it 80% of the time is kind of trial and error and based on experience also. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we can move on to our third categories, which is IVIS. Yeah. So I feel like uh, obviously those uh, two kind of senses, the visual and the tactile sense are amazing. And this is what operators train of how to cross lesions and how to feel through lesions. But it's the IVIS that is a safety, adds another level of safety with regards to uh, where you're at before you balloon, before you stent, before you use atherectomy. IVIS now allows us to know are we subadventitial in the subintimal space? Are we just uh, true luminal? Are we, and what's the actual size of the vessel? What's the characteristics of the plaque that we're in? So, all of these factors add to the wire senses and will give you additional dimensions that your wire feel does not give you as good as you are you're not going to know if you're sub adventitious unless you really looped very heavily and you made a huge loop and you pushed hard and of course you know in that case you know most people don't use atherectomy but if you did that and you still want to know if you want to use atherectomy it would be nice to kind of get an ivis catheter down to see where you're at what's the actual vessel size how aggressive you're going to be so it adds another level of safety and precision in the intervention, I think. I think it's, um, for me at least, I didn't train a lot with um, arterial IVIS. Um, mm -hmm. We used it in the venous space, but not in the arterial space. But for me, it's helped me a lot um, kind of understand, just like you said, where to where am I subintimal? Where do I need to stent from? And more, more than anything, it's helped with balloon sizing for me. Yes. I think that's, um, you know, when you're a younger operator, maybe you, you can't have the gestalt that somebody like you who's been practicing for 10 years can can do with a with an angiogram for sizing right and so i i really heavily rely on um ibis um now no. would you say you use it um in 100 percent of your cases um i would say probably 80 percent rarely we have a straightforward intervention you know as you know these days you don't find these anymore those are the types of cases where i don't use ibis but 80 percent of the time and complexity it it adds so much to the case and uh the good thing is also the other aspect is it allows you to know how bad your dissections are. You know, yeah. we say non-flow limiting dissection based on the speed of the flow on angio, but we don't know how much, how deep our dissection plane goes. So you can have non-flow limiting dissections that go through the entire media and have very poor prognoses. And obviously we don't have 
long-term studies on that, but common sense tells us that we may want to um, not, you know, uh, stop at uh, drug-coated balloon angioplasty in these kinds of cases with exceptions. But um, th this kind of knowledge that uh, kind of an, another level of knowledge that IVIS adds to the wire senses kind of leads to optimal outcomes, in my opinion. Hopefully, with time, we'll be able to show that um, over the next few years. But um, I think the, the fourth aspect of wire senses is obviously the DSA roadmap and geography. Basically, you're... Uh, now you have a, a, a you have the anatomy in front of you, especially the reconstitution, and those softwares that are available in some labs are immensely valuable to getting you on the right track. So even if you know where you're at and you feel comfortable, comfortable pushing and all of that, just a roadmap of the reconstitution can tell you no, you're not in the right place. You, you have mm -hmm. to kind of change. So even if the wire feels good, even if the wire is behaving well, adding that fourth dimension to your work, uh, I think, is very valuable. So combining all those four of these, I think, is part of what we do every day and, and allows procedures to be safe and very effective. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's a tough thing to uh, nail down in a you know hour long podcast, but, yeah, right. but but I think I think you know what you're saying is experience gets you where you need to be. Everybody has a different different set of wires and catheters that they like, which is fine. And um, just knowing where you are at all times is going to be supreme, right? Absolutely. So uh, walk me through the do's and don'ts. Sure. So uh, I just obviously based on experience, I've done a lot of mistakes in my life and learned from them and uh, I'd love to kind of share my thought process on this. Uh, so obviously, the let's start with the um, do's, probably okay. be positive. <laughs> sure, yes. So obviously, the CTO world uh, is very frustrating. And it's uh, especially if someone has time limitations, we have volumes, we have also, a bunch of patients waiting. We have the lab looking at us. We're looking at the clock. So there's an easy tendency to become frustrated, as, and that's part of normal human psychology. So I think kind of training your mind on how to stay calm, even if things are not working, I think is one of the major attributes that um, will allow you to do your job pretty well, even if you're going to be late, even if you're going to miss other things. So I think that's kind of a, a big big priority for me. Secondly, I would think a lot of people kind of feel like, I feel like get stuck into the same step and they keep doing what they're doing. And they're pretty confident that repeating that same thing that they're doing is going to lead to a positive outcome. This may be true in some hands, but in most hands, you just have to think the next step of the algorithm. And uh, if one does not have an algorithm in their mind when they're looking at the initial diagnostic angiogram, just take a few seconds, 10 seconds, look at the image in your mind. You can have plan A, plan B, plan C. And uh, if plan A is not working, very quickly switch to plan B. And I learned with the years that my switching has become so much faster. Do you have like a set, do you have a set plan A all the time and plan B and plan C? Or does it all just depend on what the primary angio looks like? Very anatomy dependent. Uh, but okay. of course, there are major preferences and, you know, like most people, but the, this plan gets outlined when I look at the angiogram. And again, there are a lot of factors that go into that, but I feel like um, generalizing is, is very difficult because sure. there are so many aspects of the anatomy that change. And that's what makes our field so beautiful. And so... Uh, operator dependent and so subjective. We love objective data, but at the end of the day, you can skin a cat 10 different ways and <laughs> all 10 different ways will lead to good outcomes. Um, so I feel like having algorithms in one's minds is very helpful. And this is where efficiency and experience come in. You can see operators who have a lot of volumes, they switch super fast. Like within 30 seconds, something's not working, they move on. And of course, uh, there's a certain limit. You can't just like, you know, do everything super fast and try to rush through things. But you know when something is not working within a few seconds. And um, 
you know, also switching to 10 different wires in every case is not the solution. So some sort of balance, like three wires, you know, but um, I think the third aspect is also to ask for help. All of us, you know, with time and, you know, with the complexity of cases, you know, we learn that as good as you are, you have to stay humble and you have to acknowledge that you can't fix it all. A lot of times also there's mental fatigue. There's a lot of uh, emotions going into the case and uh, all the other factors that are pushing you to re reach your, your outcomes and your goals kind of come in. And this is where you need a, another person, a partner, a colleague from another group who was there to allow you to kind of make sense of what's going on, especially when you're kind of overwhelmed with the difficulty. So I think sometimes one intervention from a partner can change uh, the entire kind of course of the, of the case. Uh, and the other aspect is to sometimes, obviously, we all like to be efficient and fast, but sometimes uh, slowing down gets you more efficient paradoxically. So uh, kind of uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast, like they say in the cat lab. So <laughs> When you, when you slow down, when you have a, a, a problem that's not too time sensitive, when you take a step back and kind of uh, take a deep breath and slow down your thought process, uh, the next step is going to work much easier than if you're flying through steps and you're doing them very inefficiently. Yeah, that's when you make mistakes, right? I absolutely. And finally, one of the things that I also learned with uh, experiences, the communication aspect. Whenever you feel like you're stuck, whenever you feel like there are difficulties, communicating with the rest of the team, your tech on the table, the fellow, the monitor person, uh, explaining to them what your thought process is right now, what are we at in the case, and what's our next two steps. If this works, we're going to do this. If this doesn't work, we're going to do that. And obviously, keeping a calm voice and demeanor is, is super important to uh, kind of remain in control of your ship. I feel like those are kind of my dues. Uh, would you like to add something from your experience? Gosh, I mean, I, I have like a quarter of as much experience as you. But yeah, I think um, there's a lot of times you're in a case uh, and you're the only person who knows what's going on, right? Like you've had your techs and nurses cycle through. They've been on lunch break. They come back. So I think that last thing that you said, just updating everybody on what's going on, what the next few steps are. Sometimes I give people kind of an estimated time, I think, is that until I'll be done. Yeah. Or I'll set a timer for how long I'll try a certain maneuver. And if it's not working in two minutes, I'll give it up, you know? Right. Um, or I'll uh, threateningly shake another wire at the table. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then it'll get us through, right? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, these are, it's all, it's all about kind of, you're not just managing the patient, you're really managing the room. Right. So you're managing right. the whole team and uh, and the more people you have on board who want the case to go well, the better chances are that right. the case is going to go well. And I, I think, you know, sometimes some labs are blessed with uh, technologists and nurses who are very much invested in every case and they have the same goals as you do. They want the patient to do well. But there are some labs where this is not the case and there are some type A people and type B people. <laughs> Your goals of having the best possible outcome and avoiding an amputation does not line up with someone else's goals of going home, dinner, and this is understandable. Maybe if we are in their shoes, we would have thought the same. But um, kind of aligning those goals and trying to get as much you know, common goals by explaining, by communicating, by showing your passion, I think uh, may be contagious. <laughs> Yeah, nothing's more contagious than a good attitude or a right. bad attitude, I would say. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, all right. Well, that brings us to the less fun part of this. What's the, what are the don'ts? So obviously, the first one that comes to mind is pushing the wire where you don't know where you're at. So you keep pushing, you keep pushing, and you're going to have to wait for that feedback of the tip of the wire, uh, both visually and the tactile sensation of it to give you some information. If you have no idea where you're at, you can't keep pushing. It's, uh, you know, some people think CTOs are tough. You know, of course, if you know that you're in the body of the CTO and you know you're facing a coral reef in there, of course, pushing is the answer, but you, you know where you're at. 
and you know where you're heading, you can even take the back of a wire and push it if you're sure. that confident. So pushing the wire without knowing where you're at is, is a big no-no. Uh, secondly, I would never follow any, especially 014 in the tibials or even, let's say we're in the iliac, uh, which is obviously the stakes are super high with mistakes like that. If you have an 014 wire that passed, and I would never advance any microcatheter, even if it's an 014 microcatheter, low profile, before knowing that I'm in the true lumen. And how do we know there? Obviously, you have to combine all the things that we talked about to know that. Now, passing an IVUS catheter sometimes by itself can be dangerous. So sure. you can't just pass an IVUS catheter into you know, outside the aorta and just to verify that you're outside the vessel. You can't do that. So obviously there are certain limits where IVUS can hurt you much more than help you. And this is where the big uh, do not, you know, comes in. So advancing a microcaster, a balloon, or an IVUS caster without knowing where you're at is, is also another uh, aspect of this. Um, I would also obviously continue with that same line of thought with I would never dilate where uh, I'm not 100% sure what's the end game here. Where is the tip of my wire? Uh, yeah. It's easy to get, you know, okay, you passed and the wire feels well. Okay, let's just, you know, keep going. Get me the balloon. We're dilating and now we have a disaster. Mm -hmm. So before mm -hmm. you move on, uh, you always want to know where you're at. And finally, you'll be surprised how many people even stent without being 100% sure about the, you know, true lumen versus subintimal. So, the, you know, and also partly driven by fatigue, by, you know, the need to finish quickly, by, okay, the stent is going to solve everything kind of thing. And now your, your stent is in the subintimal space completely into a false channel. So uh, those are the things that I think obviously are super important to avoid disasters. I think a lot of those are, uh, they should go without saying, but I'm glad you said them because somebody needs to say them. Very basic, you know, as simple as they are, you know, we can get carried away pretty easily in what we well, do. Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, I think we've, we've covered a lot of topics today. Um, a lot of, a very um, ephemeral topic of, of something that's tough to teach, very right. difficult to teach didactically. What suggestions do you have to young operators who maybe want to get more experience with all of these dissecting senses without, you know, having to do work on their own patients or try these out in their own cath lab. Right. So I would divide it up into two main uh, points. The first point is if you get the opportunity of someone pulling your wire or after you spent half an hour trying to cross a CTO, et cetera, of course it's frustrating <laughs> and all of us kind of cringe to that, but that's an opportunity where your senses are going to come in and your ability to go back through those planes and be able to navigate through will make you a better operator. You know, sometimes things happen for a reason. So I take it positively. Okay, let's get back and we're going to get back in. And this is where we're going to use all our senses to get through. And someone who gets through a dissection plane uh, that has been, let's say, atherectomized or ballooned, to get back into the true lumen, this is where you're going to use those uh, skills to the most. And secondly, uh, of course, all of us would like to have a wide range of wires, but I would say pick four or five different wires uh, that you feel very good with, and each wire having a function, a specific function, and be kind of the master of those five wires Uh, you know, I see a lot of people kind of getting stuck on workhorse and staying with the workhorse the entire case and struggling and using so many devices, et cetera. The, the other uh, aspect of the uh, you know, uh, spectrum is people who kind of switch to 10 different wires through one lesion. So some sort of balance. So basically pick one or two workhorse wires, one a uh, very slick polymer jacketed workhorse and one non polymer jacketed workhorse then you move on to the supportive wires have one wire spartacore grand slam iron man whatever you like that whenever you cross you're going to put that down there glad wire advantage 014 018 etc 
the third category is the CTO wires. I have two wires. You, know, you can have an Astaro 20 and a Confianza Pro 12, for example, or any wire that you have experience with. Sure. Uh, and you're not going to, you know, you go straight. Let's say you're, uh, you know the, the cap is super tough. You go to a uh, Confianza Pro 12, then you go to an Astaro. That, that, this is your escalation. You're not going to try three more wires unless you're going to go 018, et cetera. And uh, finally, the taper tip wires that you keep one or two on your shelf. So if you have like mm-hmm. five wires that you master, it's much mm-hmm. better than kind of um, fumbling with a bunch of other wires that you don't have any experience with. Absolutely. Yeah. I and mean, we didn't talk about this, but do you have a reentry device of choice that you like? I love the Pioneer and the Fempop Iliac space. Uh, it's so controlled. It's so efficient and gives you this IVIS aspect of it gives you so much confidence and kind of poking that needle. Of course, the Outback is great for operators who have pretty good experience. The learning experience is a little bit steeper. Uh, we're still waiting for a reentry device in the tibial space, but uh, some people have been using the coronary CTO system um, in the tibial space, but it's very cumbersome. It takes time, et cetera. But uh, obviously, this is a big clinical need. Definitely, definitely. Excellent. Um, Well, I I really appreciate you taking the time out on your weekend to join us and talk about this. It's clearly something you're very passionate about um, and that you you enjoy educating about. Thank you for your time. It's my big pleasure. Really a big fan of your Backtable podcast. I hope you guys reach as many people as you can because you deserve it. (laughs) And uh, it's been a big honor and pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.